Good morning, everyone. Thank you for all being with us today in the Craig H. Nielsen Auditorium of the two Mississippi Museums. I'm Chris Goodwin with the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. If you have not already, please silence your cell phones. A few things coming up to know about. On Saturday, April 13th, uh, Saturday, April 13th would be Eudora Welty's 109th birthday. And the Eudora Welty House and Garden will mark that occasion with free tours and cake and lemonade on the side porch. The annual plant sale will take place that day from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. and will feature daylilies and irises cut from Chestina, Eudora Welty's mother's original, original plantings, buckeye trees, night blooming cereus, and more. Then at 4 p.m., there will be a program launching the expanded new edition of Welty's Photographs book. That event is co-sponsored by University Press of Mississippi, Eudora Welty LLC, and the Eudora Welty Foundation. All of that taking place at the Eudora Welty House and Garden on Saturday, April 13th. Then on Tuesday, April 16th at 6 p.m. in this space, we will have the Mississippi Freedom Seder. Open to all, this participatory program will feature the rituals, readings, songs, and ceremonial food of the Passover tradition. Tickets are $30 and include dinner. There's a flyer over on the shelf where the cookie and coffee is that has all the details that you will need. Finally, I hope that you will be able to join us next week for History is Lunch when State Law Librarian Stephen Parks will present the State Law Library, its origins, leaders, and role in state government. Since the library's first home was in the old capital, we thought that was the right site for the program. Remember when we were over there, it is a museum and we cannot have food in the house chamber. Um, but it is uh, another birthday there. The Old Capitol Museum is celebrating its 180th birthday this year. There will be birthday cake and special guided tours of the building following Stephen's program, so take advantage of those. Today, we are delighted to have Shelby Harrell discussing the subject of her new University Press of Mississippi book, Behind the Rifle, Women Soldiers in Civil War Mississippi. Shelby Harrell is an instructor of mathematics at Pearl River Community College. Her research on women soldiers of the Civil War has been published in various newspapers, magazines, websites, and brochures for the National Park Service. She will be joined for part of the program by Mark Heidelbaugh, who has been involved in living history for more than three decades. Help me welcome Shelby Harrell. Thank you. Gosh. Well, Thank you all for coming. Um, I'm very glad to be here today. Um, you know who else is glad I'm here today? My students. <laughs> so, they got the day off so um, I could tell you about um, it's women soldiers, actually. That's my cover slide. So, uh, but yes, I wrote a book. Um, it is the first book published dealing with women soldiers with a regional focus. There have been a few books published. Um, about women soldiers, not that many because it is a very difficult topic to research, but mine is the first one published that, that, um, that is regionally focused. So um, let's go ahead and jump in with one of the stories that I talk about. Headquarters on board the boat Westmoreland near Vicksburg. We are within four miles of Vicksburg and are going to land and attack this evening. I expect before night comes again some of our numbers will be killed. They are making all preparations for a battle. This morning the enemy has seen large numbers on every side, but dear mother, do not let this startle you in the least, for we may live to see you again. Henry is quite well now, but he may fall. But if the troops all have as much courage as they do now appear to have, we will in all probability gain the day. We are 50,000 strong and well armed besides 4,000 cavalry and 40 ironclad gunboats. And if God is willing, we will return safe again. Mother, I am in more imminent danger than Henry is, for I am Brigadier General Stewart's orderly mounted. I have to carry messages from one part of the battle to another. You would be surprised if you were to see me, for I have turned from Henry Hart's wife to a nice young man. I will sign my name so you can see who I am. But Henry is here with me. He is Brigade Blacksmith. I shall be away from him for some of the time, but most of the time after the battle is over, I will be with him. All women are prohibited from going. Dear Mother, I will write to you again after the engagement is over. I will take good care of myself. I have got two good braces of pistols and a good saber, and I think I can defend myself. 
but we are going to have a big battle. I will write to you again soon. I must close, for I have orders to carry from one point to another, and they are nearly ready to carry now. Dear Mother, goodbye, till the pen speaks again. I will now close by wishing you a good day. We had a good Christmas dinner yesterday. How did you spend it? Write soon to James Strong, for that is my name now, dear Mother. Henry sends his love, and to you bids a good day. Direct to James Strong. I will have you direct to Memphis, Tennessee, for we have not got Vicksburg yet. Direct to James Strong, Memphis, Tennessee, care of Brigadier General Stuart Commanding, 4th Brigade, 2nd Division, Sherman's Army Corps. Write soon. Mind the directions. James Strong to Mother. The woman who wrote that letter, of course, as you can see there, was um, Almeda Butler Hart. That's a, a younger picture of her. She was probably a, a teenager at that point. You see her little baby fat she's got. Um, she was actually about 25 years old when she wrote that letter. Um, this is an older picture of her. Um, she and Henry were from Illinois. They married in 1859. Um, they had no children at the outbreak of the war. Um, Henry enlisted 127th Illinois Infantry. He was a blacksmith. You can see he's a pretty tough-looking customer. <laughs> but um, he enlisted 127th Illinois Infantry, and Almeida did not want to be left behind. So she followed him, um, dressed in feminine attire, and then um, the, the unit reached Helena, Arkansas, and Sherman ordered that all women accompanying the regiment with husbands had to remain behind and Almeida didn't want to have anything to do with that so she disguised herself as James Strong and served as um, a courier or an orderly for Breeder General David Stewart. Um, does anybody happen to know what battle she was referring to? Did you catch any of the clues? Chickasaw Bluffs, Chickasaw Bluffs yes. Um, Chickasaw Bayou also that was the battle as she mentioned Christmas um, this is 1862 so um, it was the uh, first major action um, in the federal attempt to capture Vicksburg, and it was a um, dismal failure for the Federals. But she served as a courier during that battle, meaning she was um, carrying messages, of course, um, across the battlefield at that time, but um, um, disguised as James Strong. So Henry would have been in the rear as a blacksmith, so he would not have been in any harm. You may have caught that in the... In her letter, she said that, you know, she was in more imminent danger than, than Henry was. So, um, but um, as far as, as Henry goes, um, not all soldiers died glorious deaths on the battlefield. Um, he actually died of a heart condition in March of 1863, and he's buried at Vicksburg National Cemetery. Um, Almeida returned to Illinois according to her, um, her family or descendants of her brothers. And according to the family, she remarried, um, and nobody knows what happens to her, unfortunately. So family just says that she remarried, so, but don't know to who or what happened to her, unfortunately. Okay, next one. Um, Almeida wasn't the first woman soldier on a battlefield. There have been women. Um, you can find women on the battlefield as far back as ancient times. You've heard of Joan of Arc, of course, and some of the, the other um, women way back in our history. But closer to our own history, you can find them fighting in the American Revolution, the War of 1812, Mexican War, and then, of course, um, Civil War, which is, is uh, my focus. They were there from the beginning of the war to the end. They were in every major battle on the front lines um, during the war. Um, and it's, it's interesting that these women had backgrounds as varied as their male counterparts. They came from all over the country. They came from uh, rich families, poor families. Um, some were literate, some were not. Um, Almeida, of course, wrote the letter, so so she could not she couldn't write well, but she could at least she could write. Um, some were educated, some were not. They came from cities and farms. Uh, their experiences mirrored those of their male, male counterparts um, as well. They performed the same duties. You know, they were on picket duty. They carried the firewood and, and water and things like that. Um, they carried the same heavy gear. I saw some of you over there checking out my gear. If you haven't, go pick it up and see how heavy it is. The rifle alone is 10 pounds. So they were, the women were carrying all of this gear 
which sometimes the gear could be upwards of 50 pounds. And of course, the further they marched, the lighter that got. They didn't want to carry all that, so they would just toss it to the roadside. And sometimes, you know, 15 miles a day. So, you know, go examine that if you didn't have a chance to see um, what the women carried. In addition, of course, the men, uh, same thing. Um, see how the uniforms were constructed and, and so forth. So, but they suffered just like the men did. Um, they starved. They ate the same crappy food the men did. They were exposed to the elements. Um, they succumbed to disease. Um, they were captured and um, spent time in such notorious prison camps as Andersonville, which you probably all heard of Andersonville. Um, they were killed and wounded on the battlefield just like the men did. Um, I have a, a story in my book about a woman from the 29th North Carolina that she literally had her face beaten off during the Battle of um, Alatoona, which was in October of 1864. They could not even recognize that she even had a face. So um, for the ones who were lucky enough to, to make it home, some of them went home missing arms and legs and, and you know, due to amputation. And so they experienced the same horrors that the men did on the battlefield. But unlike the men, these women had to disguise themselves because war was the domain of of men. Um, men were shamed if they didn't go to war. Women were shamed if they did. So there was a very strict uh, defining line between men and women during the time. So women belonged to the domestic sphere. They were supposed to stay home and take care of the, of the family. Men were the providers. They went out into society. And you did not cross, cross those lines. Um, if you did, you brought shame upon your family. So um, so for these women to serve their country, they had to be sneaky about it. They disguised themselves as men. They changed clothes. They probably got their brother's clothes, put on their brother's clothes. Um, they assumed a new identity. Um, they cut their hair short like a, a man, um, assumed a male alias, like you, you probably picked up Almeida's was James Strong. Um, no idea why she picked that name, but that was her her male alias, um, but it wasn't that difficult back then to disguise yourself and, and become somebody else because they didn't have driver's license or back then. So you just moved someplace where they didn't know you and you called yourself a new name and that was it. It was not that difficult um, to get away with fooling somebody. Um, but because they were disguised, we'll never know how many there were. Estimates range from the hundreds to the thousands. So when you consider the millions of men that fought, this number is insignificant. There weren't that many of them. Um, their presence did not affect the outcome of any battle or anything like that. But they themselves were significant because they were there and they weren't supposed to be. Um, they gave their lives just like the men did for the same causes the men did. So we should remember them and honor them all the same. So why did they do this? Um, like I said, if they were caught, they were shamed, their family was, was shamed, so why would they risk ostracism, not to mention their very lives fighting a war that was not theirs? Well, I think the, the major reason is to avoid being separated from their loved ones, like Almeida went to be with Henry. So they enlisted with their husbands, like Almeida, their sweethearts, uh, their fathers, their brothers, and there's at least one account of a mother creating an undoubtedly, um, how can we say it, an awkward situation for her son <laughs> when she enlisted with him. Can you imagine that poor boy probably couldn't do anything right? You know, you didn't make your bed up right, you know, that kind of stuff. So she didn't last very long. She was from Boston. She didn't last very long. They caught her pretty, pretty quickly, but they allowed her to accompany the regiment um, as what's called a matron of the regiment, a mother of the regiment. So, um, so yeah, they, they didn't want to be separated from um, their loved ones. Some of them were trying to get away from loved ones <laughs> as they were, some had very bad marriages at home. Um, some of them had very controlling, abusive fathers that uh, were trying to arrange an unwanted uh, marriage for them. Um, some of them were also trying to escape what they deemed to be boring lifestyles as they were seeking adventure. So not unlike what you saw with some of the men as well. 
And some of them were trying to seek vengeance for fallen loved ones. They had brothers who had been killed, and so they were going to try to go kill everybody in their behalf. Um, some of them were trying to improve their economic, legal, and social status. You know, women didn't have many opportunities 150 years ago. Um, you could not even leave your house unescorted um, by a man if you went out. So the job opportunities were not that plentiful. Um, if you could find a decent job, you weren't making a whole lot of money um, as a woman. But when they disguised themselves as a man and enlisted in the army, um, this whole new world opened up for him. It's hard to understand that some women saw the army as a safe haven um, and an opportunity for them to make their own decisions. Um, some of them were able to save their money and buy land that they could not do as a woman, can make a whole lot more money. Um, as a domestic, sometimes you can make $4 a month. You know, as a man in the Union Army, you can make $13 a month. So you see, you're tripling your, your income just like that. Um, and there's also accounts of women voting in the election of 1864, decades before it was legal for them to do so. Of course, they did so, you know, disguised as men, but, but they did. Um, some of these women were also patriotic, in some cases more so than their male counterparts. And I will let one tell you in her own words. Oh, if I was only a man, then I could slay them with a will. If some few southern women were in the ranks, they could set the men in an example they would not blush to follow. Sarah Morgan. Probably heard of Sarah Morgan, he read her diary and so forth. So she didn't actually fight, but I like to use this quote to illustrate just how zealously patriotic some of these women could be. Um, Northern women were also patriotic, although maybe not as bloodthirsty as the Southern women, but <laughs> they were. <laughs> so how did they get away with it? Because you're probably thinking, I would be able to recognize a woman. I, like Those people are crazy. How did, so how did they get away with it? A majority of these women came from working class or farming backgrounds. So working on a farm, um, they learned the skills necessary to become successful soldiers. You know, they learned how to shoot working on a farm. They were riding horses on a farm. So again, when, by the time they had enlisted, they, were, they already knew what to do because um, they already had learned those skills. Men's and women's spheres were strictly defined, like I mentioned a while ago, and you did not cross those, those lines. Um, clothing defined the genders. Um, women did not wear pants back then. Not only was it socially unacceptable for a woman to wear pants, it was also illegal to wear pants. There are accounts of women being arrested before, during, and even after the Civil War just simply for wearing pants. And again, I know it's hard for us to understand that 150 years later, but back then, they just didn't do it. These are two accounts from 1862. Um, one of them is in Peoria. The other is in New Orleans of two women being arrested just simply for, as far as Jenny Green goes, for cruising around in male attire. Um, so yeah, they could be arrested and or fined. So back then, you didn't even know what a woman looked like wearing a pair of pants. So when they put on the army trousers, you know, you, just, you didn't know what that, what that was about. There were a large number of young boys who served um, in both armies. I read a statistic, it was 150,000 boys, 16 or 17 years and younger served in the Civil War. Half of those were 15 years um, and younger. And so if you think about these young boys, they you know, were not shaving. They, they hadn't grown facial hair at that point. Their voices were a little higher pitched, had not changed at that point. So it's very easy to mistake a woman soldier for one of these young boys. Um, and you saw that a good bit in the newspapers. They, you know, women, when they were discovered, were described as a lad of 15 or you know, something like that. Your name? Frank Thompson, sir. Frank Thompson. How old are you, Frank? 17, sir. Look right on up. And sometimes that's all a medical exam consisted of. Not all of them were as thorough as military regulations called for, especially as the war progressed and they didn't move bodies on the front lines. They weren't terribly interested on who those bodies were. They just needed to get them out there on the front lines. 
So some cases, surgeons were just interested in whether they had a working trigger finger and whether they had two teeth to tear the cartridges to, uh, to pour the powder for the, for the ammunition. Now, some cases they were thorough. There are accounts of surgeons um, catching women trying to get into the Army through the um, medical exam <laughs> process. And there is one from Illinois where she just like ran out of the room screaming and crying when the surgeon ordered her to, to strip. So not all of them, though, were thorough, and that's how it was, it was easy for them to, to get in. Okay, so I'm a teacher, right? So you know teachers, we like to give tests and quizzes and stuff. So you're probably thinking, well, um, I, I'm still not convinced. So I'm going to show you how they were easy to get away with it. Now, this calls for participation. So you need to tell me if the following soldiers are men or women, and those are your only two options. <laughs> Okay, just two choices, you got a 50-50 shot. Woman. So, ooh, y'all got quiet. <laughs> I heard woman like across, anybody think that's a man by any chance? There's a few. Guess because you know who it is, don't you? Cheater. Yes, that's a man. <laughs> I think I got it from you, Jim. <laughs> Private John Thomas, Second Mississippi Infantry. Yeah, don't cheat. If y'all know these, don't cheat. Let everybody else give, give other people a chance. But some of y'all already owe for one. You're already not doing too well. You know how you can give him, tell us a man. Look at Adam's apple. And some of y'all still said girl. <laughs> But yeah, you, you can notice Adam's apple, and women were aware of that fact, so you would see them uh, button their coats way up high to hide the fact that they did not have an Adam's apple. I think some women do. All right, what about this one? I heard both. Huh? Why? Oh, pfft. <laughs> no, no, that's, you know, a federal frock, that's the way they were made. <laughs> But you're thinking, at least. That's great. I always want your students to think critically. I hear a lot of muttering. See, now y'all don't know anymore. You think it's a man. Why? Big hands and the chin. What about the chin? I don't know. What, I've heard big hands. I don't know about the long chin, pointed chin. Some of y'all need to pay attention to my tablecloth. That's a girl. <laughs> Yeah, um, this is, yeah, she does have big hands. Yeah, I admit that. You'll, you'll find out why. This is Sarah Rosetta Wakeman. She went by her middle name of Rosetta. Um, she was five feet tall. That's it, five feet tall. Remember, people were smaller back then. I'm actually the average size of a male soldier. Well, if I took the heels off, I would be very painful four inches. Um, but um, men, I'm the actual, si actual size of a male soldier, average size, which was 5'8", 145 pounds. That's the average size of a male. So women would have been smaller. Like I said, Rosetta was 5 feet tall, and she carried that 10-pound rifle and all the other gear with it. She was actually, she was very tough. She got in a fight during the war and, and beat up a guy 7 inches taller than she was. But he was picking on her, and, you know, she stood up for herself which wasn't very high since she's only five feet. She had blue eyes, brown hair. Um, she was the oldest of nine children in upstate New York. Um, their father did not manage their farm that well, and uh, they found themselves heavily in debt. And so Rosetta, who was working as a domestic laundress cook, that kind of thing, before the war, um, said it just, just couldn't happen. She just wasn't making enough money to help the family. So she actually left home before the war disguised as a man, and she worked on a coal barge, and she made $25 for four round trips. Um, and it was during one of these trips that she encountered recruiters for the 153rd New York Infantry. They enticed her with a bounty of $152 and a soldier's pay of $13 more for month, per month, which she, of course, accepted. She enlisted, and she sent money home um, every chance she could to help her indebted family. Um, she enlisted 153rd in New York on August 30th, 1862. Um, she, um, with the unit, they were involved in the Red River Campaign over in Louisiana. Uh, 
very physically demanding um, campaign during the summer where you had them wearing dark blue uniforms and Louisiana's uh, hot heat, you know, like we have here, um, marching long miles, um, bad water, bad food, and a lot of the, the male soldiers ended up succumbing to disease from that campaign. Um, Rosetta, um, she came down with chronic diarrhea, which is a very debilitating disease that claimed a lot of lives um, during the Civil War. Um, she was hospi hospitalized in Alexandria, and she was later transferred to a hospital in New Orleans where her, when her condition worsened. And there she died on June 19, 1864. Um, she was 21 years old when she died, but she's buried in Chalmette National Cemetery. So next time you're in Chalmette, you can look up her grave. She's buried under her male alias, Lyons Wakeman, um, because they probably did not know her true identity when she was buried. You know, when you have a disease like diarrhea, dysentery, there's no need to examine the rest of the body. They just kind of let them waste away and uh, bury them without examining their body. So, um, but it was not until um, 1976, actually, when the connection was made, that the family's civil war relative was actually a woman. Her letters had been preserved um, and published, so you can buy her letters in a book called An Uncommon Soldier. Um, so, but yeah, all she wanted to do was to help support her family. That's why she enlisted, and of course, she ended up paying for it um, with, her, with her life. Okay, the one on the left, I know it's kind of hard to see with hands on hips, that one, as the quiz continues. I heard both. <laughs> I heard breast. <laughs> yeah. I hear a lot of talking, but not a lot of answering. That's, that's a trick. It's a trick question. It's got to be a man. It's got to be a man? Yeah, it's a trick. Oh. <laughs> we actually don't know. Uh, we actually don't know. Um, this is, um, I think it might be Jane Perkins. I don't know. Because this is the whole picture, and this picture is of POWs um, at White House Landing, and there is historical documentation that a woman soldier named Jane Perkins was taken prisoner and held at White House Landing before they were all shipped off to Point Lookout, which is uh, a, a bad prison in Maryland. So there's documentation that places a woman that the military um, believed to be a woman treated I uh, believed a woman to be a soldier, treated her as a soldier, as a POW, at White House Landing, and that's pictures of POWs at White House Landing. So, But we'll never know for sure if it is indeed a woman, never know for sure if that is Jane Perkins, just interesting to kind of think about. Okay, this is the last one. So those of you who have not been doing well, you can redeem yourself your last chance. That's a woman, you say. Boy, y'all got y'all have gotten quieter. Every picture, y'all just kind of like, y'all are done. You're waving a white flag. You're done. It's a short woman. Oh, and they got the collar up high too, so it must be a woman hiding. <laughs> that is a small waist. They were they were small people though. We don't know this one either, so. <laughs> I just wanted you, when you leave here, that, you know, when you look at Civil War photographs, look at it a little, you know, a little harder, a little closer, because you may be looking at a woman soldier in disguise. You don't know. But you see how easy it was for them to get away with it, how they looked like men or men looked like women, however you want to say that. So, um, yeah, so there's evidence right there. Okay, so women soldiers in Mississippi. Uh, the map, uh, you see the red on the map, these are battles that women soldiers were involved in, which is pretty much every major battle in Mississippi, and I talk about these in my book. But um, here in Mississippi, um, resources um, 
um, our state had resources that both sides deemed um, extremely valuable to the war effort, and of co uh, meaning the, of course, the Mississippi River. Um, of course, you see Vicksburg and all the, the the battles leading up to Vicksburg along the river, and then of course you see in the northeastern um, corner was Corinth, because at Corinth was the intersection of two major. Um, railroads called the crossroad of the Confederacy. So you see all the battles in those areas because both sides were fighting over the resources there. You see in the north central part of the state is um, Holly Springs and in 1862 Earl Van Dorn um, raided the federal supply base there, caught the federals at um, off guard and um, for the ones who were not captured during the raid they fled north uh, to Coldwater Station. Um, Confederates pursued them there and Confederates ran into a very green 90th Illinois infantry called the Irish Chicago's Irish Legion and in that unit was my cover girl, my book. <laughs> uh, Frances Hook was in the 90th Illinois infantry. Um, she stood shoulder to shoulder with her husband in this unit and fired into the pursuing um, Confederates, um, Company G of the 90th Illinois Infantry. Um, she was described as medium height, dark hazel eyes, um, dark brown or black hair. Um, and there's been a whole lot of wrong information um, that has persisted through the years about her, partially because of her own doing, because when she was discovered, she didn't, and a lot of the women, course did not want um, anybody to know who they were so they would lie about their name they would lie about where they came from um, so it made it very difficult to try to research them but her name was not even Frances Hook it was actually Elizabeth Quinn was her real name um, she had several actually feminine um, names actually that was just a couple um, Eliza Miller was another name she went by. So who was she really? Again, she was, her real name was Elizabeth Quinn. Um, she was from Illinois. Her parents were Irish um, immigrants. Um, she had a younger brother, Thomas Jr. Um, their mother died shortly after Thomas Jr. was born. Um, their father was not very good. So I guess that's the kindest way that I could say that. Um, after his wife died... Um, he basically began shuffling the two kids around to different families in their community. He didn't want to take care of them anymore. Um, and eventually the responsibility fell on his brother, Peter. So Peter took the two kids in, paid out of his own pocket to care for his brother's children. Um, sometimes they would, they, would, um, they would go to other families as foster children. And of course, those families were paying money out of their own pockets to take care of the children. And Thomas wasn't helping for any, it was not supporting them at all. And so Peter got fed up with it and he sued his brother for money to, for, to recomp you know, himself from all of this money that he was paying him you know, for out of his own pocket and other families. So he sued him um, and he won the lawsuit. I don't think he ever collected the money. But um, Thomas, I mean, uh, yeah, Thomas, the father, retaliated by taking Peter's wife. Peter sued him again for about $75,000 by our today's standards. I don't think he ever won that lawsuit. But, um, but yeah, all of this was going on in 1855 when Elizabeth was about 9 or 10 years old. So you can see the chaos that was in her life at that point, the the drama that was going on for this, this child of 9 and 10 years old. And it gets worse because in 1860, Peter died. So now she has nobody but her younger brother um, in her life, um, which, you know, daddy doesn't want her. So she runs off to Chicago. And um, there she joined the 90th Illinois Infantry as um, Frank Miller. So can you blame her to get away from that, from all of that mess? She was about 16 years old at this point when she went to Chicago and um, joined this, this unit. Um, and then, of course, at Coldwater Station, the skirmish there, she was um, shoulder to shoulder with her husband. At some point, she got married to a guy named Jerry Kane. Uh, don't know when that happened, but um, they were also involved in the Siege of Jackson. 
Um, and then in October of 1863, while foraging in Florence, Alabama, um, Confederates, or it's for, for, you know, foraging, you're just going out looking for food, that kind of thing. Um, the Confederates shot her and captured her at that point, shot her, in, or sh they captured her and, and they shot her in the leg as she attempted to escape. Um, she was sent to Atlanta as a prisoner of war and then exchanged at Graysville, Georgia, February 17, 1864, with 26 other uh, federal prisoners of war. At that point, gangrene had set into her leg, and she was sent to hospitals in Chattanooga and Nashville. And, is that, and while she was recovering in Nashville is when she had the two photographs made that you see. Um, and she actually sold those uh, by recommendation from the nurses there, to help her raise money. So um, she's finally released from the hospital nearly eight months after she'd been shot. Uh, she was released June 10, 1864, and it's not known where she went immediately right after that, but um, her husband, Jerry Kane, was, was killed at the Battle of Ezra Church a month after she was released from the hospital, and he's buried in Marietta National Cemetery in Georgia. Um, but Elizabeth ended up in Ohio after the war, and she married Matthew Angel in 1866, so she married an angel. So it all, it all worked out, right? So Matthew was a, was a fellow ex-soldier himself. He was a member of the 2nd Ohio uh, Heavy Artillery. They had two daughters together. Um, and then June 8, 1872, two weeks after the birth of their second daughter, Maggie, um, Elizabeth died of dropsy. Do y'all know that's backup of fluid from um, a heart failure? So she was only 28 years old. And that's a picture of her taken um, not too long before she, she died. So she's still not smiling. Is she? <laughs> she had a pretty rough life. But, I mean, you know, at the end, she, she seemed, you know, happy. She was married and had a family and so forth. But as far as her name, um, as soon as she was discovered um, after she'd been shot in exchange, she told reporters that she was Frances E. Hook. And so that's where that name came from. And she actually went by Frances for the rest of her life. Okay, unidentified woman in the Missouri Brigade. This is not her, by the way. <laughs> this is... <laughs> this, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> This is her brigade commander, Francis Cockrell. You probably know Cockrell if you've done any research in Civil War at all. But um, Francis Cockrell led a very vaunted brigade, Confederate brigade historian. Some historians consider it the best on either side. Um, and it's interesting that you had at least woman with the distinct possibility of one or two more um, in this brigade. But the one that we know for sure, we don't know her name. We don't even know a specific unit she was involved in. But um, she was described as tan, dirty, freckled, and she smoked corncob pipes. But with the Missouri Brigade, um, she would have been all over Mississippi. They fought in a lot of battles um, here in Mississippi. But she left Missouri with her husband and brother. Um, they were killed early in the war, and she continued to serve, like I said, all over here in Mississippi. Matter of fact, at Champion Hill, battle right before uh, Vicksburg, um, Cockrell's brigade slammed the Federal Brigade of James Slack. And in Slack's brigade was the 24th Iowa Infantry, and in the 24th Iowa Infantry was a woman named Mary Smith. So at Champion Hill, you saw brigades facing off against each other that they contained women. I don't know if they ever saw, you know, met each other face to face on the battlefield, but the brigades did. So. I think they should have just let the women, you know, take care of it at that point. Clear the way. Let it would have been over right then and there, I promise. But as far as this woman, um, the uh, Cockrell's Brigade went out um, east. And during the Battle of Alatoon in October 1864, this unidentified woman was shot in the leg and captured. And that's how we know about her. And that's all we know is from the point where she was wounded, she told her story. We don't know who she was, what happened to her, anything else. So that's a woman uh, on the Confederate Missouri side. Here's one on the Federal Missouri side. We only know her by her male alias of Charles Younghouse, Company E, 3rd Missouri Infantry. Uh, she was a 27-year-old German immigrant. She was 5'5", five five, so she's a little bit taller than Rosetta was. 
brown hair and eyes, and she, she said her pre pre-war occupation was a farmer. She enlisted in 3rd Missouri from the beginning, August 1861. She was at Chickasaw Bayou with Almeida, um, the courier that we heard about beginning. Um, she was involved with the destruction of Jackson in uh, May of 1863. And during Vicksburg, have y'all been to Thayer's Approach at Vicksburg? Have y'all tried to walk that? Yes. <laughs> it's really good for walking off Thanksgiving dinner. It's, it's, this picture doesn't do it justice, okay? Just go there. It's a very good workout. Um, so, yeah. But, um, so, Young House, with her unit, uh, made this assault with, uh, with the 3rd Missouri. So, again, it doesn't do it justice. Go there, check it out, and um, you'll have a whole new respect for it, I promise. But 3rd um, Missouri was in support of Thayer, and they made it up about halfway um, they ended up getting pinned down. They had to, to stay there overnight um, and then withdraw under the cover of darkness. But as far as Young House, they too went out, to, went out east to Georgia to participate in the Atlanta campaign. And during the Battle of Resaca, May 14, 1864, she was shot in the head uh, while salting two hills. Um, she did not die immediately. She actually lingered for a few days, and then she died um, and they buried her with her secret. Because again, you know, if you're shot in the head, they're just going to let you go. You know, there's nothing they can, they, they put a bandage around her head. That's all you could do. Um, and then, of course, when you die, you just throw them in the ground because there's so many of them, so many dead, that, um, you know, you just get them in the ground as quickly as you can. No use in examining the body. So they didn't know who she was when they buried her. 1866, though, um, they were reinterring bodies to, for reburial in national cemeteries across the country. And it was then when grave diggers exhumed her body and they noticed, ah, she's got some, or this soldier's got some pretty small feet. <laughs> I, I don't know what the feet's got to do with it, but that caused them to examine the body closer, and that's how they discovered that Charles Younghouse is actually a woman. Um, and she is buried in Chattanooga National Cemetery with her name horribly misspelled, which is okay, because that's not even her real name anyway. Jenny Hodgers, um, Albert D.J. Cashier, this is one probably a lot of you may know about. If you do any research on women soldiers, you see her name pop up a lot. But she was an illiterate Irish immigrant who settled in Illinois before the war. She enlisted at the age of 19 in um, 1862, she was 5'3", with red hair, blue eyes, typical Irish person. Um, and she listed her occupation as a farmer like Younghouse did. So they were probably just farm laborers. They worked for farmers. But um, she, with the 95th Illinois, she participated in Grant Central Mississippi Railroad Campaign. And then, um, let me go back. That's her on the right, by the way. <laughs> And then um, at Vicksburg, um, the 95th advanced through this area. Of course, you recognize the Shirley House and then the big Taj Mahal looking, you know, Illinois Monument. So next time you go to the Illinois Monument, go find Company G, the tablet, and you will see Albert D.J. Cashier because they misspelled apparently everybody's name back then. But her name is on the, the uh, tablet inside the Illinois Monument, but um, she enlisted out of patriotism and a desire for adventure. And at Vicksburg, she would find all the adventure she wanted. Matter of fact, she was captured at Vicksburg while out doing reconnaissance. But she escaped whenever she seized her captor's rifle and knocked him down with it and got away. And uh, she apparently stood upon the works and taunted the Confederates at Vicksburg, which was probably my relative she was taunting here. But um, when Vicksburg fell, um, she did not march into the city with her unit. She was in camp suffering from dysentery, which she suffered from her entire life. Um, after Vicksburg, uh, the 95th was ordered to Natchez, where they occupied the city for three months. And then the following year, in June of 1864, she participated in the Battle of Bryce's Crossroads, which um, was very disastrous for the Union. But... Um, so she did make it back home to Illinois. Um, she had participated in over 40 battles and skirmishes at that point. 
Um, and she mustered out in August of 1865 with her secret intact. So nobody knew that she was a woman during the war. Um, she was by herself. She had no family to support her. She was completely by herself. And, of course, after she mustered out, she no longer had a job. So what is she going to do? Is she going to return to feminine life and all the restrictions and, and the, the poor pay? Um, no. She, she maintained her masculine disguise and um, continued to support herself. Um, she was not discovered until 1911, actually, when she was performing odd jobs for State Senator Ira Lish. Um, I think she was picking up sticks in his yard, um, and he backed over her with his car, breaking her hip in the process. So while, of course, in the process of um, treatment, she was discovered, um, it was becoming increasingly difficult to care for her, so they put her in a soldier's home in Quincy, um, and then in 1913, her secret was finally leaked to the press. And, you know, of course, what the press does, they leaked it to everything. And everybody in the country, um, everybody knew about Jenny Hodgers in 1913 because the newspaper spread her story like wildfire. But also that year, the state judged her insane and institutionalized her in Moline in an asylum. And they forced her to wear a dress, which she was not used to wearing, and she tripped while wearing the dress. And I don't know if she re-injured the same hip or, or broke the other one, but um, she ended up dying from an infection from that fall. Uh, she died October 10, 1915 from the infection, and she's buried in Sonoman, Illinois. She has a civilian headstone as well as a military um, headstone, but she was um, given a full military funeral. She's buried in her uniform. And interesting enough, she wasn't the only woman in the 95th Illinois. There were two more women in that unit. Um, they were discovered early on before they made it to Mississippi, but um, they tried anyway. Okay, what about our, Missis our women soldiers, Mississippi's women soldiers? Of course, that's not one either. This is not the men or women anymore. Um, this is Brigadier General Winfield Scott Featherston. He led a brigade of all Mississippians at Battle of Peachtree Creek in the Atlanta campaign. Um, during that battle, um, he led his Mississippians uh, forward to exploit a hole that had opened up in the federal lines. By the time, though, they had advanced, the Coburn Federal Brigade uh, closed the hole, closed the gap, and Featherston found himself, being, found himself being shot to pieces on three sides. So he had no option other than to withdraw and leaving his uh, dead and wounded in his wake for the Federals to, to pick up. Um, and the Federals, of course, cared for the wounded. Oh, by the way, Featherston, um, his casualty rate was over 50%. Casualty, kill, wounded, missing, captured. Uh, and two of them were women that the federal, federal surgeons t um, cared for. One of them had been shot in the ankle, had her, her foot amputated. The other, she was 19 years old. The other one was shot in the chest and the thigh, and it's not sure whether either who either one of them were or even if they lived. Gettysburg. Um, this is Private Garrett Deacon of the 12th New Jersey. He stood picket duty the night um, after Pickett's charge. Um, he wrote about the horrors of all the screaming and hollering after Pickett's charge, and he said that one of them was a woman um, right beside him on, Pickett's, on picket duty. Um, the 12th New Jersey faced Joseph R. Davis's brigade during Pickett's charge, and Davis's brigade was comprised of the 2nd, 11th, 42nd Mississippi Infantry in addition to the 55th North Carolina. So there is a chance that that woman was a Mississippian. Don't know for sure, but perhaps. This is a very interesting one. Woman enlisted as William Bradley, Company G, what would become Company G, Miles' Legion. Um, she enlisted in April of 1862. This, this company was raised in Natchez. She managed to serve for a few weeks before it was discovered that she was mustered in through mistake, was of female sex. And um, this is a rare snowfall in Natchez. The um, photo was taken somewhere between 1850 and 1890. 
Um, you see, the, of course, the, the columns, that's the bank. The little building next to it was a store at the time. Across from the street is where this woman was discovered. And um, I was there in October, made a video to show you where, where that, that um, place is today. Mark and Shelby here in Natchez, Mississippi. It's one of the state's oldest cities and one of the country's wealthiest cities at the time of the war. And I am uh, walking up Main Street here in Natchez towards Commerce Street. Over to my right um, used to be a, um, a grocery store at the time. Uh, James Grillo had a grocery store slash uh, restaurant. It was about here at the time of the war. And more importantly, across the street from James Grillo's store is where a woman was discovered um, marching up with her unit here on the street, and it happened right over there. So, no, I'm not going to win an Academy Award, I know that. But that's, um, that's Main Street approaching Commerce, so next time you go to Natchez, you can check it out. So her sergeant, Patrick Burns, said that nobody in the company knew that she was a woman. So how was she discovered then? Her master recognized her because she was a slave. She was a runaway slave girl from Natchez, Mississippi, who enlisted in Miles' Legion, which was a Confederate unit. Um, obviously, she, uh, she was light-skinned because she was a black woman. Black is defined by society at the time, passing as a white man in a Confederate unit. So, um, so uh, Burns said that she was, described her as a bright-colored girl. Um, obviously, again, she, she had to be of mixed race, but defined by black at the time. So interestingly, uh, interestingly enough, this Natchez slave girl was the first black woman to serve as a documented soldier in the ranks. And it's interesting that her service was in the Confederate Army. Um, William Faulkner, even the prolific Mississippi writer, was aware of women soldiers serving during the Civil War. Uh, 1930s, he published a series of short stories called The Unvanquished, where one of his characters was Drusilla, who enlisted in his uncle's cavalry her uncle's cavalry unit to avenge the death of her father and fiance. Again, fictional, but at least, you know, he was even aware of women soldiers back then. Okay, so to conclude, I am going to invite Henry Clinton Parkhurst to the stage. Good afternoon. My name is Henry Clinton Parkhurst, Clint to my friends. I'm from the beautiful little river town of LeClaire, Iowa. I joined along with 1,441 fellow Hawkeyes in defense of my state in the 16th Iowa. 715 of them never saw home or never saw home the same. Like all of the boys or a lot of the boys and women in the ranks, I wrote about my time in the Army. Some of these incidents moved me so much that I set them in poem form, and I'd be honored if I could share one with you this afternoon. It's entitled, A Campaign Incident. Within the bloody trenches lay the fairest one of slaughter's prey. His eyes were fixed with stony stare and yet his lips betrayed no pain. But high resolve was mirrored there, as though the doubtful field to gain were worth the piles of mangled slain that, snow that smoked beneath that torrid air. To see if life could still remain, a sergeant grim with powder stain, a rude rough fellow quick to dare, yet kind of heart as women are, in tenderness knelt by his side and lifted back his dabbled hair and rent his bloody dress aside. When lo, a woman's breast was there, a startled oath the soldier swore, then slowly rose in blank amaze. Strange weird things we had seen before in ventures wild of stormy days Alas, we saw fair cities blaze. We saw the fierce tornado blend its wrath with man's 
and heaven send its lightnings down to quiet ours. Around us were destructions, powers in every form and every phase. In mellow light of summer moons, Louisiana's wide lagoons had borne us far to scenes where, well, you might have deemed a wizard spell, had bid the low green shores expand to vistas of some fairy land. On Tennessee's rich fields of fruit, along Tallahatchie's tide, where amber Yazoo's floods are mute, or the Tuscumbia glides, where Vicksburg towered in her pride, disputing for imperial sway, much had we seen. No future day will far excel, much to appall, to startle, rapture, or dismay. But this strange sight surpassed them all. The trumpets pealed, there was no time for lamentations or the dead. The foremost lines began to climb a wooded height, whereon twas said, the foe had rallied for a stand. And so upon that gory crest, we made a grave where she might rest, and laid her down with tender hand, her woes unknown, unknown her name, she sleeps upon her field of fame. No storied page her deeds will tell, but calm she sleeps, and all is well. Thank you. So, um, I included this poem because that woman was discovered at Big Black River Bridge. So, she may still be buried there. So, um, if you would like to ask either one of us questions, um, raise your hand and Mr. Goodwin will be around to let you speak into the mic. Yeah, I, well, in a community of soldiers, did they ever have to, how did they bathe? Uh, they didn't. Oh, not at all. <laughs> well, they did, but some of the women explained it that they couldn't swim. Um, you see letters from male soldiers saying that they um, they bathe with their clothes on, so they could bathe themselves and their clothes at the same time. People were a lot more modest back then, too. So um, you didn't see them undressing a whole lot in front of each other, even even to bathe. So yeah, so the smell must have been terrible. In, yes. How did they get training? How what? How were they trained? How were they trained? Uh, and uh, the same as the men. They went to uh, the, the training camps and so forth, the same as, as the men. And one thing um, is a bit of an observation. Um, in Mississippi, where you, at that time, during the Civil War, the great majority of the people in Mississippi were black, slaves. Mm -hmm. And my understanding is that when the Union armies invaded, come, came into the South, they, um, many of the slaves, men and women, they rushed to be rescued by the Union armies. Mm -hmm. And the Union armies often put the slaves, men and women, and to, to do various kinds of work. Mm -hmm. What I'm trying to say is that black slaves engaged in a lot of work with the army. They, they did cooks, they cooked, and they cleaned, and they helped the wounded, and so on. And my understanding is a soldier mark, a soldier, marches on his stomach, meaning he has to eat mm -hmm. to be a good soldier. And a lot of those black women, slaves, did a lot of cooking. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a very important contribution. Absolutely. To the mm -hmm. war. Uh, and, 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 uh, and somewhere we had to remember that slaves contributed greatly to the war effort. Absolutely. 
Good point. We have actually come to the top of the hour, um, but it was a great presentation, so I won't, I don't think anyone will complain about it. <laughs> there are lots of things for you to look at and learn about over here. There are copies of the book for sale for $25 in the store, and Shelby will be glad to sign copies of it. Thank you all for coming today. I hope that we see you at the Old Capitol next week. Help me thank Shelby Harrell for this program today. Thank you.